Is there a second chance to be saved after death? That's something that people commonly think. That in other words, after death, there is an opportunity that the lost are given to believe at that point in time. It's sort of a, a second chance, if you will. That concept is in many ways similar to the concept of reincarnation. You know what reincarnation is. Reincarnation is the idea that after you live this life and you die, you come back as a different person. Uh, you may come back as a higher, more spiritual person, or you may come back as a lower person, depending upon how you lived. Uh, maybe you come back as an animal. There's different, there's different schools of thought on how that works, but the idea of reincarnation is that this life in and of itself is not the end. You can come back for another life. A similar concept, this is a secular concept, there was a song called Stairway to Heaven that was, in, in various listings, it's been identified as the best or the most popular rock song of all time. Uh, there's a lyric in, in that song that goes about like this. Yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. See, what all of these things do, all of these ideas, whether it's reincarnation or there's still time to change the road you on, you're on or there's a second chance, the idea is that after death, there is some opportunity to get right with God. That's the idea. <clears throat> Not saying I believe that. I'm telling you what the world often thinks. Now, one of the reasons the world thinks that, and this is just my opinion, you can decide for yourself, is people find that thought comforting. People like the idea of a second chance. They realize that they often mess up, and who doesn't like a second chance to get things right? In golf, they call that a mulligan. Uh, in, in, uh, in football, when you're playing in the backyard, it's sometimes called a do-over. Uh, it's the idea that, hey, just forget that. It's like control Z. It's, it's like undo, right? Let me undo this and let me fix it. Well, you can see why people would be comforted by that because it means they have another shot. They have another opportunity. Some people think that the idea of a second chance addresses the problem of those that haven't heard during this life. And so let me talk about that just for a minute. One of the things that I've learned is that when you tell people the gospel, there is one basic objection, and then there's a smaller secondary objection. And so let's talk about each of those. People often think when they witness to people that they're going to get bombarded with complicated, complex questions that they can't answer. Well, that, that happens from time to time. But I'll tell you my experience. You can decide for yourself. When we've set up a, a booth at the county fair and talked to hundreds of people, what I find is there's two common objections, really, and then everything else are just rare, isolated things. By far, the most common objection is, it can't be that easy. You're telling me salvation is by grace and I don't have to do anything? You're telling me I can live a terrible life and still be saved? You're saying I can believe and then do a wicked thing and still be saved? And so the, the single most common objection to the gospel, is that works are required. There has to be something that you have to do. It can't simply be grace alone. That's the most basic objection people have because they feel that, that their pride, their self-righteousness compels them to want to do something. They want to be able to point to something they did to demonstrate that they earned it. That's what's most common. 
Now I want to talk for just a minute about the second most common objection. Now this one is not nearly as common, but you will get it from time to time. And that objection is this. What about those that haven't heard? Now this is my opinion on this. You can decide for yourself. When you're telling someone the gospel and they raise the question, what about those that haven't heard? There is a reason, there is a heart motivation as to why they are raising that question. The question doesn't really apply to their situation because the question is about what about those who haven't heard and they're in the process of hearing. So the answer doesn't really apply to them. But the reason why people ask that question is the following. If those who haven't heard get a free pass, if they aren't accountable, then they don't want to hear what you have to say because you're going to make them accountable and they might be happier not knowing, pretending that they've never heard, that they've never had enough information to be held accountable. Well, get with me Romans 10. So where I want to start tonight is I want to start by demonstrating to you from the scriptures that the idea that there are those who haven't heard seems to be an unscriptural idea. Now, why do I say that? Look with me at Romans chapter 10 and verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. It's near thee. It's not far away. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So let's make sure we understand that verse. Is the word of God far away from man and distant and impossible to locate and no one knows where it is? Or is the word nigh thee, in fact, even in thy mouth and in thy heart? Let me give you an example of this that I always find telling. I have seen, I have witnessed, I've seen unsaved people, non-Christian people, take the name of Jesus Christ in vain. Well, they're not saying that because they're believers, but what they're revealing is a knowledge of who the true Lord is. Have you ever been in a workshop and someone will make a mistake and hit their thumb with a hammer. And what they'll do is they'll curse in the name of Thor. Have you ever seen that happen? And they just, they smash their thumb and they say, Thor! Have you ever seen that happen? Have you ever seen them do that and say, Zeus? You've never seen that happen a day in your life. And the reason why you haven't is it makes no sense to curse in the name of an imaginary God. It's just, it's a foolish thing. It's utterly pointless. But it's, it's logical, it's unfortunately natural to sinful man to curse in the name of the true God, and, and that's why people do it. So when you see that behavior, you're seeing the truth of Romans 10.8. The word is not far away, it's nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy, thy heart. It tells you the truth is not distance. Romans 10.18, Romans 10.18, But I say, have they not heard? That is literally the question people ask, right? What about those that haven't heard? Well, Scripture asks that very question in Romans 10.18. 
And notice what it says. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So where is God's word gone? Everywhere. The answer to have they not heard is that they have, because the word of God has gone to them. Look with me at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. My personal belief is that Romans 1 verses, uh, Romans 1 as a whole, but particularly Romans 1, 18 to 25, is the best simple summary of how man thinks today. It, it explains his internal thought processes. So look with me at Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. That's interesting. So mankind has an awareness of God's wrath. One of the proofs of that is when people get mad each, at each other, what do they do? Well, sometimes they will say to the other person, go to, you know where, right? Why are they saying go to you know where if it's fake? I mean, what, what would be the point of telling someone to go to, I don't know, Xanadu or, uh, you know, um, Alice in Wonderland? I don't know. I'm trying to think of fake places. Asgard? Um, why would you tell someone to go to a fake place? I mean, what would be the point of that? But if you tell someone to go to hell, as people do, that's an understandable thing because the wrath of God is revealed. So notice what it says here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So God reveals his wrath against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So men are ungodly, they're unrighteous. And then notice what it says about them. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. So let this pen represent the truth. What does unrighteous man do? He, he holds it. it. Is the truth far away and impossible to find? Or is it within man's very grasp? So verse 18 says that the, the unrighteous man, the ungodly man, he holds the truth, even in his unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's open, it's obvious, it's plain as day. Why? For God hath showed it unto them. See, do these verses sound like people don't know, or do these verses sound like they absolutely know? Verse 20, well, I've never seen God. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Notice, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. And notice the last part of verse 20 so that they are without excuse. I ponder if that is the most hated phrase in all of the Scripture. See, what, what we're really good at doing is rationalizing our behavior. Have you ever done something wrong, but can you quickly come up with an explanation of why it's not your fault? why it's really someone else's fault. Yeah, I did, but here's the reason. I had an excuse. I had a, a rationale. Here's why it's not so bad. See, we're really skilled at that. But what Romans 120 says about our ungodliness, our unrighteousness, our, our wickedness, is that we're without excuse. Get with me Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. See, what all these verses so far have shown you is that it's not that the truth is so far away man can't find it. It's, it's right next to us. It's near us. It's in our hearts. It's in our mouths. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So how many men has the grace of God appeared to? All of them. Get Acts 17. Acts 17. 
Acts chapter 17, verse 26, Acts 17, 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So here's something to think about when you think about the issue of of race and ethnicity and, and all of those issues. Do you know what all men share? The same blood. Because every single person you've ever met, every single person you ever will meet, you know what they are? They're sons of Adam. They're sons of Noah. In other words, we're all related. We're all part of the same family. There's just a very large family tree. And obviously, Jesus Christ died for all of mankind. You see there the the commonality of man, I trust. And hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. Now notice verse 27, why did he do that? That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him. Notice, though he be not far from every one of us. Is God distant? Is he aloof? Is he up there in heaven unreachable and unknowable? And we're just down here and and, and we don't matter to him at all. Well, that's not, that's not the way that it is. In fact, what Acts 17, 27 says is he's not far from every one of us. So what all those verses tell you is this. When you think about the question of what about those who haven't heard, Scripture indicates just the opposite. It indicates that people have heard. It indicates that people have sufficient information to be held accountable. And in fact, they will be held accountable. So the first thing we're going to notice is this. With the idea that people get a second chance after death to believe, sometimes people think that because, well, there has to be some mechanism, there has to be some way for those who haven't heard, they need to get a chance. Well, with all these verses we just looked at tell us that they have heard enough to be accountable. So then let's turn to the main question we want to consider, and that question is this. Is there a second chance to be saved after death? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse... 27. I believe this is the clearest verse in the Bible on the subject. Notice what it says. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So men die once, we know that, and what follows after it? Judgment. It doesn't say, that that verse there it rules out reincarnation, doesn't it? That verse there denies there's still time to change the road you're on. That may not be true. That verse denies the idea of a second chance after death, because what, ha- what do you face after death? You face judgment is what you face. Another thing that verse denies is that verse denies purgatory. People sometimes have the idea that what happens is after death, if you're not good enough to go to heaven immediately, you'll spend time in purgatory, you'll burn away your sins, and after you're there long enough, then you'll go to heaven. But purgatory is not in the scriptures. And Hebrews 9.27 directly teaches against it because it says what happens after you die? You face judgment. And what that means is that it's absolutely critical. It's, it's essential. It, uh, there's, I'm trying to find the words to emphasize this sufficiently, and I can't. You have to be, you have to believe the gospel. You have to be right with the Lord before you die. 
because there is no second chance after you die. That's something that is just made up. It's man's wishful thinking. There's nothing in the scripture that would indicate that's the case. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And as you're turning there, I'll just share with you this thought. Life is complex, and modern life is very complex, right? If you just think of all the the things you have to do, right? You know, you've got work, and then you've got to deal with health, health issues, and you probably have transportation issues, and you probably have something in your life that breaks down, whether it's a computer or a phone or a car. There's just all sorts of problems in life, aren't there? There's always lists of things to fix. And so there's, there's a lot of things that compete for our attention. But I'll tell you, the issue in eternity is really simple. And that issue is whether or not you believe the gospel. Notice with me 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So let me ask you this question. When is the right time to get saved? And the answer is immediately, if not sooner. Years ago, I remember this event for some reason, but I was witnessing to someone, and the person told me that she didn't want to get saved at this point in life. She was a fairly young person, and she was going to get saved later in life because she had had some things that she wanted to do first. And, you know, just to be honest with you, that doesn't make a lot of sense. What does Scripture say? Behold, now is the day of salvation. We all know that we don't know when we're going to die. People die in traffic accidents all the time. They just go out to to work, or they go to the store, or they go to wherever, and for whatever reason, they get in a traffic accident and they they die. I had a a relative who was a a gentleman who was in, in good health, and he was a doctor. And he was, as a doctor, walking his rounds, seeing his patients, and they couldn't find him. And when they went to find him, he had been in a patient's room treating a patient, had an aneurysm, died, and hit the floor. And that's what happened. So he's a healthy healthy guy in the prime of life who was a doctor in a hospital, and it was time. And you just, you never know about these things. That's why scripture says, behold, now is the day of salvation. You don't wait. You can't count on having some future opportunity. You have to get saved immediately. And obviously, this verse teaches against the idea of some second chance after death. It doesn't say sometime in the future is the day of salvation. It says now is the day of salvation. Look with me at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and then notice what this says, and shall die in your sins. Well, if there was a second chance to get saved after death, it wouldn't matter if you died in your sins. But there isn't a second chance to get saved after death. And so these people, now this is, you know, let's be clear, this is under the kingdom program. This is before the cross. It's not during the dispensation of grace. I know all that. But the point is, was the Lord telling those folks that they had a second chance after death, or was he emphasizing to them that they better solve this issue during this life? He was telling them to get this issue solved during this life so they don't die in their sins. Look at verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. Then notice what it says. For if ye believe not that I am he, 
you shall die in your sins. He's saying if they reject him, what they'll do is they'll die in their sins. And the obvious meaning that he has there is if they, they don't believe in him, they reject him, they die in their sins, and they end up in hell. Well, the, the whole notion of dying in your sins means you don't have a second chance after this life. You have to believe the gospel during this life. Get Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Now, this is another verse that pertains to kingdom salvation. I understand that. But you'll see how it reinforces the conclusion that we're looking at. Look at Matthew 13, verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. Now, let's just make sure we understand where we are here. So Matthew 13 is written right here before the cross. But Matthew 13 is talking about what happens at the second coming where the Lord sends forth his angels. Now, notice what happens here. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. What the Lord does at the second coming is the Lord returns to the earth and he takes judgment on his enemies. And he's going to set up his kingdom that lasts a thousand years. Well, does the Lord want in his kingdom things that offend? And the answer is no, he doesn't. So what he does is he sends out his angels to gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. In Matthew 13, 41 and 42, when those angels go out, they go out and they grab living people who are offenders and they gather them out of his kingdom. And where do they take them? Verse 42, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Now, does that verse suggest to you there's a second chance? Those verses say the opposite of there's a second chance. What happens is those angels are sent out and those things that offend are gathered out of the kingdom and they're cast into a furnace of fire. So what do all those verses mean? Here's what all those verses mean. All of those verses are teaching there is not a second chance to be saved after death. See, here's what people would like, and let's just be honest. A lot of times what happens is we're, we're guilty of wishful thinking. We believe things because we would like them to be true. And so we find it comforting to think, you know what? Even if I am not right during this life, even if I have neighbors and friends and family that are unsaved and they die, they'll have another chance later on to get things right and everything will be okay. But based upon the scriptures, it seems like that's giving people false hope, doesn't it? Because none of the verses say that you can get things right after this life. No, they say just the opposite. They say that after, after death, what man faces is judgment. Therefore, it is critically important that what we need to do is we need to preach the gospel. We need to tell people that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. We need to tell them that salvation is not by works, it's by grace. They don't need to join a church. They don't need to tithe. They don't need to quit all of their bad habits. What they need to do is they need to, in their inner man, they need to make a, a faith decision. They need to, de to decide to put their faith in the blood that the Lord Jesus Christ shed for him. Romans 3 uses the beautiful phrase, faith in his blood. In other words, when you, you quit trusting in yourself, you quit trusting in your resume of good works, and instead what you do is you, you recognize that Christ died for your sins that he paid the full penalty for your unrighteousness on the cross, and you put your trust in the blood that he shed for you. The moment that you do that, you're eternally saved. That's the gospel that we need to preach. 
That's the gospel that people need to believe, and they need to believe that during this life. So is there a second chance after death? No, that, that there is not. It is necessary for people to believe the gospel during this life.